Uh, welcome to this Fistula Community of Practice webinar. Today we are talking about promoting women's well-being through physical rehabilitation and particularly how we can integrate this into fistula and maternity care. My name is Vandana Tripathi and I'm the director of the USAID funded Fistula Care Plus project implemented by Engender Health. Next slide please. I know everyone who's here knows about, cares about fistula, but briefly, it is an abnormal opening in the upper or lower female genital tract, and it causes uncontrollable urinary or fecal incontinence. It also causes tremendous psychosocial, economic, and quality of life consequences for the women who live with this condition. Up to a million women live with fistula around the world, and there are still thousands of new cases per year. The most common cause that we talk about is obstetric, when fistula is caused by prolonged obstructive labor that isn't managed well or, or perhaps at all. We see though more and more iatrogenic fistula, meaning fistula that's caused by unsafe surgery, particularly cesarean section. And there are the other causes you see here, particularly trauma, including sexual violence. Next slide, please. The Fistula Care Plus project uh, has started in late 2013 and we will be ending in early 2021. We've worked in the countries that you see here, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in Bangladesh, in South Asia. Next slide, please. Through USAID funding, Engender Health has supported more than 44,400 fistula repairs, trained 365 fistula surgeons, and more than 31,000 other healthcare workers in skills related to fistula treatment, but also its prevention through maternity care and voluntary family planning. And as you see from the graphic here, the vast majority of these repairs have been successful. Next slide, please. So today um, we have an amazing group of um, folks joining us, um, some in person, some in other ways. Um, and we have a wonderful moderator in Allison El Ayadi. And Allison will be introducing the other speakers, but I'd like to introduce Allison. She is an associate professor in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences and Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of California, San Francisco. Her research program, focuses on improving maternal health and reducing maternal health disparities in lower resource settings. She develops and evaluates evidence and theory-based interventions that address the structural, social, and interpersonal contributors to these disparities. Allison obtained her doctorate from Harvard, her MPH in reproductive health from Tulane, and her BA from Colby. Allison, thank you so much for joining us, and I will hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Vandana. And um, again, welcome everyone to today's panel, promoting women's well-being through physical rehabilitation, integration in fistula and maternity care. Thank you so much for joining us. As Vandana mentioned, um, I'm Allison Eliadi, and I'll be moderating our session. So before we get started, I want to note that any questions that you have for the panelists should be submitted using the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen under the presentation. If you're having any general or technology related questions, please feel free to use the chat feature. Today, we're going to be sharing work that's been supported by Engender Health USAID funded Fistula Care Plus project known as FC Plus and carried out by FC Plus partners, the organization MAMA, and Pansy Hospital in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Maternal morbidities such as pelvic organ prolapse and obstetric fistula affect women's ability to carry out daily tasks and participate fully in society. Surgical treatment is often required to repair these conditions. However, for many women, physical therapy can make a profound impact on the severity of symptoms and quality of life. Despite this impact and the low cost of physical therapy relative to many other interventions, these services are often missing, particularly in low resource settings. So today our speakers will discuss the value of integrating physical rehabilitation within fistula and maternity care and showcase practical tools and success stories from their experiences. Some of our speakers are joining us live and some via recorded video, audio, and even visual quotes. So I will go ahead and introduce all of our speakers now. 
Jessica McKinney has 20 years of career experience as a women's healthcare provider, educator, and advocate, with current roles as a vice president at a women's digital health company, Renovia Inc., adjunct university faculty at Andrews University, and consultant in global community women's health at MAMA LLC. Her career has included over 10 years as faculty in a female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery fellowship program and mentorship of physical therapy students and early career professionals. Ms. McKinney has presented on obstetric fistula, reproductive morbidities, gender-based violence, and health and human rights at numerous national and international meetings and has related publications. She received her master's in physical therapy from Virginia Commonwealth University and is currently a doctoral candidate at Andrews University Doctor of Science in PT program with a concentration in women's health. Laura Kaiser is a physical therapist and independent public health consultant with clinical expertise in women's and pelvic health and child health and development, and over 10 years of experience, including in India and in multiple countries across Africa. She is a seasoned researcher, writer, speaker, and educator with a special interest in reducing health disparities, improving population level health literacy, advocating for gender equity and human rights. And she has published and lectured on her work in global health and community-based care and consulted with local and international organizations, including Global Strategies and Gender Health, USAID, the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, Heal Africa, and Pansy Hospital and Foundations. In 2017, Dr. Kayser co-founded Mama LLC, a consulting firm with expertise in women's health and development. She also provides clinical and research support to Renovia Inc., a women's health company with a digital health platform focused on diagnostic and therapeutic innovations for female pelvic floor disorders. Dr. Kayser received her master's and doctorate in physical therapy from the University of California, San Francisco, and completed her master's in public health from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Rachel Kinja is a doctor assigned to the fistula program of the Pansy General Hospital since January 2017. Since 2018, Dr. Kinja has been leading the physiotherapy department at Pansy Hospital under the guidance of Dr. Kenny Raha and with support from Mama LLC and in collaboration with the hospital's kinesiotherapy department. At Pansy, Dr. Kinja and her trained staff guide physiotherapy sessions to all patients admitted to the hospital and diagnosed with fistula or pelvic organ prolapse, women preparing for childbirth, women supported through connected organizations, Pansy Foundation and V-Day, as well as all levels of Pansy Hospital staff. Dr. Kinja completed her academic studies at the Evangelica University of Africa in 2013. Kenny Raha Moroyi is a gynecologist and obstetrician and surgeon treating obstetrical and traumatic female genital fistulas. Dr. Raha has worked at the Pansy Hospital, founded by Dr. Dennis Mukwege and located in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo for 14 years. In addition to caring for women in the urogynecology clinic at Pansy, Dr. Raha also provides services in Pansy's infertility clinic. He has also been able to reach many women in several provinces of the DRC through outreach services applying the PANSI model. Dr. Raha is also a teacher at the Evangelical University in Africa, training doctors in appropriate obstetrical practice. As a member of the FIGO Fistula Surgery Training Initiative, Dr. Raha is involved in the training of physicians in high quality management of women with fistula. He is a member of many global expert organizations such as ISOFS, FIGO, IUGA. Dr. Raha has also conducted clinical research in DRC on issues including obstetric fistula, complications of cesarean section, and sexual violence. As you've heard, Vandana Tripathi is the director of the Fistula Care Plus project. She is a researcher who is focused on measuring quality of care in maternal and newborn health services and improving access to health care, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Prior to her research work, she served as the head of programs at HealthRight International, where she supervised the development, implementation, 
and evaluation of health and human rights projects, both globally and in the US. Vandana has also worked on reproductive health and HIV AIDS programs at organizations including Planned Parenthood of New York City and the Ford Foundation. Vandana received her PhD from Johns Hopkins, her MPH from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and her BA from Brown University. So thank you so much to all of our presenters today. I would like to um, move into the presentation. Great. Um, thank you so much, Vandana and Allison. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you all um, this morning. Um, next slide, please. So um, there's a few ob objectives for um, our, our portion of the talk this morning um, that I've got listed here. And while um, the audience takes a moment to review, I just would like to take a moment to acknowledge Engender Health um, for their commitment um, really since 2013 to physiotherapy capacity building efforts in the context of fistula and maternity care. Um, it truly is unprecedented, um, at least to my knowledge. Um, and um, for that, we are incredibly grateful and, um, and it's really lent well to sustainability for the program that we've been able to begin to develop. Um, next slide, please. So I'd like to begin by examining our working definition of what, it, what is health and what does it mean to be healthy. Um, I imagine many in our audience this morning are familiar with the WHO definition of health that's listed on this slide here. Um, and this was truly um, a, a big shift in thinking um, kind of mid uh, of the last century um, with the intention to, to really move beyond, be, uh, beyond the perception of health as merely the presence or absence of disease and to raise awareness about the um, kind of multi-dimensional nature of health um, from social, mental, and um, physical well-being. Next slide, please. Um, in more recent years, however, there's been some efforts to, um, to maybe amend this definition once more in light of a growing body of research that highlights um, the multiple spheres of influence on one's health um, from the molecular and genetic level um, all the way to the individual and their environment and to society at large. We've also experienced over the last 70 plus years um, an, uh, an epidemiologic shift from acute illness and infectious disease to um, more non-communicable and chronic diseases. So in the context of maternal health, we see um, global maternal mortality rates declining over time, but um, which is great news that women are surviving childbirth, but perhaps are left with, um, with a burden of maternal morbidities um, that is on the rise. So essentially people are living longer while managing some level of disease burden. And so to that end, um, some researchers have uh, begun to propose a new conceptualization of health as the ability to adapt and self-manage. Now, to be clear, there has been no consensus on this um, new definition of health to date, but I think this characterization lends well to the practice of physical therapy, which is really a profession that's largely focused on function and adaptation. Next slide, please. So here we see an illustration of the ICF model, that is the International Classification of Functioning Disability in Health. Uh, the first iteration of this conceptual model was introduced in the 1960s and has certainly evolved over time as we've con come to learn a little bit more about the environmental and social influences on um, individual and population health. So essentially it demonstrates the relationship between disease or injury and resulting disability. And um, what, uh, what I feel like we gain from this framework is an understanding of disability as a, as a human experience and one that um, many of us may experience either in, for short or long term duration at some point in our lives. So it really helps us to measure health and not just a disease state or an illness or an injury. Um, you can see from the, the multi-directional arrows and, and the different boxes on this slide, that it, it really is trying to illustrate how disease or injury affects our daily function and how we interact with the world around us, and then in turn how the world around us influences our experience of disease, illness, or injury. And I think it's important to, to begin to understand and have a grasp of this language when we consider integrating physiotherapy services um, into medical and surgical care. Um, 
in the practice of physiotherapy, we typically do not treat a disease or illness itself. So in fistula care, um, there's not really anything physiotherapy can do to close the hole that is the fistula, um, but we treat the body structures and functions that are affected by it. We, and we help, our, um, help women, help our patients find ways to recover or adapt um, their daily activities so that they can improve their participation in society. Next slide, please. Uh, the ICF model also guides us to identify contextual factors in the environment and within each individual that influence health and um, can even predict um, treatment needs and needs for medical care over time. Um, these contextual factors can be positive or negative and they can enable or prohibit certain health outcomes. The mural in this image is from the physiotherapy department at Heal Africa Hospital in Eastern Congo. And I think you can, you can see from the image that there are several quite overt or, or very visible physical disabilities. Perhaps you can begin to imagine that an individual with a disability such as a lower leg amputation, um, how their health and their function may be affected based on where they live, so the physical environment that they're in. Um, and of course, we can see um, extreme differences from a high versus a low income country, but even within the same country, um, you know, a rural versus an urban setting is going to offer different access to resources um, and perhaps even different um, community beliefs and cultural beliefs about health, about disability, about well-being that will um, influence how that person is able to um, exist in the world and function in the world. I also want to point out the woman in this image. Um, I think she has quite the presence and it seems likely that perhaps she's the caregiver for one or more of the individuals in this painting. And um, and it's quite likely that, um, that she may be experiencing a maternal morbidity or maternal disability herself. Perhaps she's recovered from a fistula surgery or she's struggling with issues related to pelvic organ prolapse or incontinence. And I point this out because um, uh, not always, but very often maternal disabilities are, um, uh, are perhaps a little bit invisible. Um, and, and for that reason, I think are often poorly studied. So um, it's not to say, you know, women are certainly um, surviving and, and learning to self-manage, but perhaps with a lower quality of life um, due to the absence of adequate health services. Next slide, please. So why physiotherapy? Um, here we see um, the, the World Physiotherapy um, is the global governing body for our profession. And I've uh, just listed a few excerpts from uh, one of their position papers. Uh, just to highlight the breadth, um, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know why this is advancing on its own. Do you mind going back? Thanks. Um, uh, I think this highlights the breadth of knowledge and, and really the scope of physiotherapy practice. Um, and, and you can really appreciate our profession's broad role in restoring and maintaining mobility, function, and independence. Um, and truly, we um, uh, as physiotherapists emphasize treatment of the whole body and the whole person and not just a, a single um, symptomatic body part. Next slide, please. And um, here we've taken that ICF model and kind of expanded on it a little bit. So you have the health condition at the top, the body structures and functions, activity limitations and participation concerns in that middle box, and then those um, environmental context um, factors uh, at, the, at the bottom. Um, and I apologize, I'm not sure, thank you. Um, I'm not sure why this is advancing on its own here. Um, but essentially we've taken those um, kind of broad um, uh, terms within the ICF model and simply applied it to the context of maternal morbidities. Um, so you can begin to appreciate how um, different bodies and structure, body structures and functions may be affected by different um, diagnoses um, or um, injuries, obstetric injury, et cetera. Um, I think uh, by, uh, you can say two things here, you can see how this can really um, aid a provider in understanding which areas to address um, so that um, she can really work uh, to improve the quality of life of each individual patient, um, because not all women with a fistula are going to present with the same um, concerns in each of these areas. And so you can really start to um, tease out what may be beneficial for each patient. And I think that this model truly places the woman at the center of her own care um, and, and, and allows her to, to have some agency in driving her own health care and, and dictating what is important to her in terms of her recovery. Now we can go to the next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so now that we've made the case for the importance of physiotherapy and rehabilitation services, you can see on this slide um, a, a huge challenge in building capacity um, for this service line. 
So we know that in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are not enough physicians for, uh, to offer medical care for the, the population there. Um, on average, it's about 10 per 10,000 or one in 1,000 um, uh, across, uh, across this region. However, when we look at rehab uh, rehabilitation professionals, it's an estimated 0.5 per 10,000 people. And that's inclusive, not just of physiotherapy, but occupational therapy, speech therapy, um, audiology, uh, sort of a, a, large, a very wide um, group of rehabilitation providers. Um, <clears throat> we know that the burden of disability tends to be much higher in these low resource and low income regions. So it's a, it's a true disparity um, in, in terms of um, uh, access to, to these services. We'll also just add one point here, because um, there's a, a couple of statistics here um, on the lower half of this slide. And often, um, uh, women's health concerns and maternal morbidities are actually not factored in to um, to, to many of these statistics. Um, and in fact, um, it's often um, even left out of important research um, that is looking at the, the rehabilitation needs in these countries. Um, and that's partly due to lack of data and um, poor reporting in this area. Next slide, please. So Jessica and I began our work in 2013 with Engender Health and the Fistula Care Plus program. Um, there's just a, a brief timeline here. Uh, we began our work in um, Eastern DRC at Pansy Hospital in 2013. Um, prior to that, we had worked um, at a couple of other regions in Eastern Congo as well. Um, and then really efforts um, to, uh, to build capacity as part of the FC Plus program um, began in 2015. And we supported two sites, in Niger one in Nigeria and one in, in Eastern Eastern Congo um, and did quite a bit of program development uh, during that time. And then in 2018, I sort of took a lot of what we had learned and some of the educational materials and attempted to um, put it into this training guide that we're talking about today. Um, that was completed uh, late last year and we're now um, engaged in translation efforts. So we hope uh, by early next year, um, uh, copies will be available in English, French, Swahili, and Portuguese. Uh, next slide, please. So when we began this work, um, and, and honestly, even to date, um, there is really very limited uh, research and that's very spe that's specific to physiotherapy and fistula care. Um, there are three publications on the topic. Uh, one, uh, Jessica and I were able to author uh, back in 2013, um, related to work we had done at Heal Africa Hospital. And then there is uh, another uh, two studies that are from a fistula camp setting in Benin. Um, essentially, these are more descriptive studies that um, do demonstrate feasibility um, um, acceptability of the service among women, um, and they do report on some positive preliminary outcomes. Um, so with that in mind, um, our, our work, including this training guide, is really informed by just basic science and uh, functional anatomy principles, um, as well as the broader evidence base for physiotherapy in the context of maternity care. Next slide, please. Now, later this morning, we'll hear from um, Dr. Kinja and Dr. Raha at Pansy Hospital, and I'll allow them um, to, to use their words to, to describe the benefits that the program has brought to their hospital. Um, but you can, you can begin to imagine um, all of the benefits that um, both uh, community and really society at large can gain from um, investment in rehabilitation, um, not just improving the health um, kind of workforce and the ability to treat these, these women, but to start to understand um, the, uh, to, to kind of quantify the level of disability and the burden of maternal morbidities in this population, um, certainly reducing costs and length of stay and, 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 and that kind of thing related to medical care. Um, and then um, uh, the economic benefits sort of for, for the country at large um, by reducing the burden of disability and enabling women to return to work and, and meaningfully contribute to their family and community certainly benefits um, the whole. Um, Next slide, please. So I'm going to hop in here. Thank you, Laura, for that um, intro. And Allison Vandana, thank you for your early introductions. Um, I'm going to spend our next few moments together taking you through a fairly high level introduction to the training guide, making note of what is included, how we envision it being used, and very importantly, how you can get your hands on it if you don't already have a copy. As has been mentioned prior, this training guide was a joint project with USAID and Gender Health and Fistula Care Plus, working together with me and Laura at MAMA 
We are so thrilled at its completion, that it's open access, and that the translations are forthcoming in Swahili, Portuguese, and French. It is incredibly exciting for all of us that this is one of the legacy projects of what has been a multi-year effort for everyone involved, spanning Fistula Care Plus and the preceding Fistula Care project. The image you see on this slide is what you'll see when you go to the website listed, www.themamas.world slash training dash guide. You'll be prompted to complete a brief survey prior to accessing the guide. This is to inform us of where you are in the world, to learn about your interest in the guide, and it contributes to us fulfilling our commitment to the monitoring and evaluation of how it is being distributed and implemented around the world. It's also a great way for us to be able to stay in touch regarding any future updates to the guide or to share other relevant materials with people who are a part of this community. And to date, it's been downloaded by health workers in Africa, North America, South America, Asia, and Europe. That has been thrilling for us and we remain excited to continue to observe its reach. Next slide, please. At the beginning of the guide is a table of contents to orient the reader. The first three sections, the introduction, the contextual statement, and physiotherapy in the context of women's health are brief writings intended to familiarize the reader with the role of physiotherapy, concepts of health and disability, and how these manifest in low resource healthcare settings and in women's healthcare. I think of these writings as communicating the spirit of the training guide and, and really the spirit in which it was written. Following this, there are six formal sections, five of which will be introduced in the next several slides. There's some variance in the intended audience and use for each of those sections, which is outlined. Next slide, please. This is the first page of section one. The bold font lets the reader know that the anatomy and function of the pelvic floor are covered. However, I want to draw your attention to the language below. Every section will have a similar paragraph summarizing the section's content, but also making clear the intended audience. It's noted that this information may be a review for healthcare workers with training and experience in obstetrics and gynecology, and it may serve as an education to others. In either case, it is a resource for health education for the patient. The pages and images may be reproduced as patient handouts or posters, including the artwork depicting the anatomy, all with the goal of supporting health education for women. Next slide, please. This slide shows you an example of subject headings, supporting content, and various imagery. So we see here there are five different views, all labeled, of the female pelvis. These reinforce the text on the page and they can be reproduced as standalone educational resources. The content under each subject header, for example, under what is the pelvic floor, can be helpful resources to guide conversations with individuals or groups of women who are care seeking or may be reached on outreach missions. Next slide, please. Section two is again familiar material to healthcare workers who have been active in obstetrics and gynecology. It's not designed to serve as patient handouts in the same way that section one has been designed. However, the language and the imagery can still be useful for explaining the health conditions of fistula, pelvic organ prolapse, and urinary incontinence to women and their communities. Next slide, please. Several teaching images and definitions are included in this section, including an overview of fistula and an explanation of the fistula subtypes of vesicovaginal and rectovaginal fistula. This provides education to the healthcare worker new to this space and also can be useful for educating a patient about her health condition. Next slide, please. We've included a similar amount of description and definition for pelvic organ prolapse. As noted earlier, the Fistula Care Plus project included pelvic organ prolapse in its scope. This is another potentially disabling pelvic health condition frequently linked to a woman's obstetric history. These materials are useful for the new to the space healthcare worker as they learn new terminology, common symptoms of prolapse, and understand naming and staging of the prolapse. And I wanna emphasize something that Laura said earlier um, in our presentation, that the physical um, impairment of fistula or of a pelvic organ prolapse is not cured by the physiotherapy intervention. However, having the physiotherapist or the full physiotherapy team knowledgeable about the health condition is valuable to patient care. 
It's valuable to patient education efforts and to multidisciplinary collaboration in women's healthcare. There also is evidence to suggest that physiotherapy techniques and interventions can be helpful in mitigating the symptoms that are associated with it and help to improve function. Next slide, please. Section three returns to the ICF model that Laura introduced at the beginning of our presentation and returns to this and disability and health nesting it in the context of women's health. The user of the guide gets to appreciate how this comes together in a thoughtful way and it is supported by case studies. This is a section we recommend for all members of the healthcare team. If there is someone who is tasked with learning about physiotherapy and they're using this guide to do so, we recommend sharing this particular section with the entire team, allowing for there to be a shared language and a learning around disability, function, and a woman-centered approach to both. Next slide, please. We advocate for woman-centered care in addressing health, disability, and function. We provide example questions to help get to the heart of this in the patient interview, suggesting questions about social and family roles and self-care, and asking about the degree to which she is limited in these very important tasks. This slide also shows one of the featured case studies in the guide. This is the section on the right-hand side of the slide. It's about a young woman with long-standing fistula following prolonged obstructed labor. And we'll follow that into the next slide. So we can advance to the next slide, please. Thanks. And these two pages are about how her case continues to be illustrated in that case study. The ICF model has been populated according to the findings of the patient interview, medical history, and physical assessment. Recommended treatment options are described, including health education for the patient, and bladder retraining consisting of fluid intake schedule and timed voiding. All of the treatment options are described in more detail elsewhere in the training guide as noted in the body of the case study. Next slide. Sections four and five together focus on the patient interview, physical examination, and recommended interventions. These are two sections that are clearly intended for the trained healthcare worker. The physical examination and the pelvic floor muscle examination in particular are to be used by healthcare workers who have been trained in providing direct patient care. Next slide, please. We provide several examples in the guide of questions to use when asking a woman about pain and about incontinence. I think this information can be especially helpful when there is um, a healthcare worker who's already working in physiotherapy capacity, but they're new to women's health perhaps. Um, they may be adept and comfortable with conducting a patient interview, but maybe not so comfortable talking about urine and stool and genitalia. So a sample framework to use in conducting patient interviews we believe is very helpful as a tool and thus was contained in this section. Next slide, please. We also have information on the aspects of the physical examination. There's a description of abdominal wall and muscle assessment, as well as internal and external pelvic floor muscle assessment. For anyone steeped in gynecology, but perhaps not on the physiotherapy side, this is distinct. It's different from a classic pelvic exam. It's a different type of physical examination um, where the classic pelvic examination is organ focused. And this is a specific examination that is more pelvic or muscle focused. Um, it's something that very clearly should only be done in the hands of a trained healthcare worker. I'm also compelled to note here that we strongly espouse informed consent principles in this guide and historically in our teaching of any of this material. Just pause for a moment to recognize that the process of the interview, the physical examination, um, and the treatments can be completely foreign to some women. Also, many women will enter into this process bearing some level of trauma. I would suggest that anyone who has a history of prolonged obstructed labor a resultant fistula and likely resultant loss of the fetus has experienced trauma. The way this affects women and manifests can vary, but it is imperative for the healthcare worker to be sensitive to known or suspected trauma and to be deliberate in educating her throughout the process. This may include explaining why certain questions are being asked and being highly attuned to nonverbal signals from the patient. It is also important to make her a partner with you providing consent every step of the way, and also aware that she can withdraw consent if an aspect of the examination becomes uncomfortable physically or otherwise. Next slide, please. A note here about the physiotherapy treatment techniques. 
included are several different exercise progressions that are inherently not highly personalized. They are informed by observation, experience, and evidence, and they provide foundational building blocks for movement, function, and physical activity. They are intended to be useful even if there's only one interaction with a patient, or the interaction happens only in a group setting, or a physiotherapist is supervising another individual who is instructing exercises. We've endeavored to present principles of different types of movements we believe are supportive to healing and to function. I really wanna put this out there, especially knowing that our webinar participants today include many colleagues who have been trained in and practice in high resource settings um, and for whom highly individualized and specialized therapy prescriptions are common. This training guide is a starting point for many in women's health and as such, the included recommendations for treatment are also a starting point. These can be expanded and become more focused whenever the individual healthcare worker has more knowledge, when they are in a setting where their resources are such that they can have longer periods of time to interact with women in physiotherapy or to have more numbers of contacts with individual patients. Next slide, please. The suggested exercise sequences are based on symptoms, physical impairments, and commonly observed functional limitations. The instructional material informs the healthcare worker who teaches the patient, but also may be reproduced as patient handouts with images only or using the images in text. We include instructions for breathing exercises and exercises for mobility, strength, and balance. It has been observed that women at a facility and waiting for care may be quite sedentary as they await surgery and a program of individual or group exercise focused on lumbopelvic mobility and circulation can be useful. So with that, I'm going to pause, turn it back over to Allison and see if there are any questions of what we've covered so far um, before we move on to hear um, from our colleagues, Dr. Raha and Dr. Kinja about our experiences working together to strengthen the physiotherapy program at Ponzi Hospital in Bukavu. Thank you so much, Laura and Jessica. I um, would like for us to take a few minutes to respond to your, any um, questions that the audience has at this point. Please um, enter your questions in the, the Q&A chat, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So this has been um, such a an interesting orientation to these these models of health and um, congratulations on the development of the guide and its upcoming availability not only in English but in French, Swahili, and Portuguese. It seems to be a very important educational resource for, for those interested in expanding the capacities in their settings. Um, one question that's come up is what is the typical dur duration of a course of therapy Um, I'll jump in here. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. And um, there would be, um, I think, a more specific answer um, in the context of, you know, the, the United States where, um, where I work and Jessica works. Um, but in our experience, um, it's, it's quite variable. Mm -hmm. um, and it will depend on um, the, the type of fistula setting. So, for example, Pansy Hospital um, is, a, is a full-scale tertiary care hospital um, that is doing fistula surgeries quite regularly. Um, there's also a model of fistula care that is a little bit more of a camp setting where uh, women might come for a couple of weeks to maybe two to four or six weeks. Um, they come in, they get surgery, and once the catheter is removed, they, they exit. So, um, so it's really going to have to be tailored to the setting that you're in. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have attempted to get uh, preoperative physical therapy integrated at, at uh, Pansy um, mm -hmm. and, and at some of the other settings that we've worked at, and that's just been a challenge. I think there's just a lot going on in those days leading up to surgery that it's, um, it's just been hard to implement, um, mostly because of lack of human resources and, and other types of resources. Um, but the period after surgery is usually about a two-week window um, where some, um, a lot of education and some level of exercise can be introduced. Um, and then if uh, women are able to stay even just a, a period longer, um, you know, we can follow up with a couple of weeks after that. So I would say it's quite variable. Um, if a uh, if a woman has transportation issues, so for example, she's kind of stuck at the hospital for three months, she might come and engage in, in physical therapy a couple of times a week over that time, mm -hmm. time frame. If she's being discharged, you know, with 
within a few days of that catheter being removed. It may just be one or two touch points. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. So I'd like to, to bring in one additional question about, um, you know, it was really remarkable to, to see the presentation or the statistic of the number of rehab healthcare workers per population, especially compared to the, the ratio of um, physicians in this mm -hmm. setting, which we already know is ex extremely um, low. I'm right. really curious to think more about integrating or expanding um, women's access to physiotherapy and rehabilitation care. And given this lack of human resources for health and would love mm -hmm. to learn your perspectives on how can we do this given the limits and capacity. Yeah, I, um, well, I would say that the creation of this training guide um, is, is part of our attempt at answering that question. Um, because in our experience with, with Pansy, um, as Laura mentioned, they are a tertiary care facility um, and have, have kind of gone between having one and two physiotherapists for the entire hospital's needs. Um, and so from, from the beginning of, of that experience, um, we have really worked uh, cross-functionally with their team um, so that aspects of um, everything that is included in this manual are um, kind of layered throughout uh, the patient experience. So there are, are educational components of this um, that may be owned by nursing or by social work. Um, and you know, we've, we've incorporated group-based treatments um, so that not everything is delivered in a one-to-one -one setting. Um, so um, those are some of the things that we have done. I think that this is much like the how many how many visits or how long will someone get care? Um, this is going to be an exercise in creativity for most facilities um, or organizations. Um, but I think that it, it starts by um, having kind of a team-based approach um, and, and really having the idea that um, at least endeavoring to do something along these lines um, may still have you know, a positive outcome for someone, um, even if it isn't you know, eight visits of one-on-one -on -one care, for example. Um, so, you know, common terms of like task sharing or task shifting have been common. And it's why you'll see that in this, um, in the training guide, we've used the terms like physiotherapy informed care, um, knowing that, you know, in, in circumstances where the need to deliver rehabilitation services and health education is so high, um, it's unreasonable to um, expect that all of that is going to be done only by a university trained um, physio. Great. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, Allison. So we do have a few more questions, which um, one has a, one of the questions that I'd like to, the, or the final question that I'd like to pose during this, uh, this section, and maybe we can get back to this a little bit later as well, um, is around the, the gender implications of um, both building PT capacity in low-income countries and, and whether PTs in, in low-income countries are more likely to be male. I think you've, you've talked a little bit about the task shifting possibility and, and this, may, um, this may respond to that question, but I'm curious to know is the, how is gender, how have you conceptualized the, the need to consider gender in the delivery of these services? How can we address that? That's a um, great question um, and a challenging one. And I can't say we have a hard and fast answer for it, um, but it's true. Um, I would say on the whole, it's, it's a uh, more male physiotherapist uh, in, in this context that I've seen uh, compared with female um, physiotherapists. Um, I would say in my experience, and this is across several countries in Africa, that um, there is a keen interest among all the physiotherapists that I have lectured to and that Jessica and I have worked with um, mm -hmm. to learn more about maternal health care. Um, mm -hmm. Because very often these physios are seeing um, not just you know, maternal health concerns, but that they, they essentially see everyone, children, uh, you know, 
know, adults, um, a variety of diagnoses. So they're, they're, they're keen to know uh, something about this topic. Um, I was able, I had the opportunity to give a lecture in Niger as part of the World Physiotherapy um, Program several years ago. And, um, and, and we actually had a wonderful discussion and were able to impart some, um, some real knowledge and skills that didn't necessarily involve doing an internal pelvic exam, but, um, but to understand some principles um, of rehabilitation, some education, some exercise um, interventions that they could still offer women um, and then work it hand in hand with perhaps a midwife or an OBGYN who might then be able to um, do the more intimate nature of you know, uh, aspects of that, um, of that exam. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you very much. So we'll have another opportunity, two other opportunities to get to additional questions. I'd like to ask the presenters to move into the second portion of their presentation, the case study at Pansy Hospital. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so I am just going to speak for a few minutes about Pansy Hospital and provide an introduction, to, um, and then we'll have the opportunity to hear um, directly from uh, from one colleague from a pre-recorded uh, um, interview, and then um, look at some some quotes from another colleague. Unfortunately, that her connection is not good enough to join us, so I will do my best to um, to do her justice. Um, next slide, please. So for anyone who's not familiar with Pansy Hospital, it's um, a tertiary care facility located in Bukabu in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Con Congo. Its medical director is Dr. Dennis McQuaige, who was the uh, 2018, um, he was awarded the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize for his work um, and advocacy against sexual violence as a, as a weapon of war. Um, he hosts a team of 12 gynecologic surgeons um, and, of course, a number of nurses, social workers, and psychologists, and, um, and one, one, physiother one university-trained physiotherapist and one um, technician has been added um, over these last uh, period of years that we've been engaged there. Um, they're seeing a, quite a high volume of gynecologic surgical cases each day, uh, a handful of fistula patients, as well as other types of gynecologic injury. Um, and they have been a partner with um, in gender health for over 15 years in the fistula care um, programming. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview of, of kind of what, what we learned along the way, how we were able to kind of assess the needs at Pansy from seven years ago in 2013 when we first um, uh, arrived there and, and then over the years. Um, what we really worked hard to, um, to educate the staff there and to work hand in hand with the staff to create the most holistic program we, we could. So we didn't want to come in and just say, well, we're going to teach pelvic floor muscle exercises because that's one of the things that we do as physical therapists, but how can we look at um, the whole woman and, um, and address uh, a variety of concerns from mobility, uh, function and independence issues, pain issues, um, obviously health education, physiotherapists, among other providers have a broad role there. Um, of course, pelvic health specific um, programming and education, and then um, some of the musculoskeletal concerns that we also see in the context of maternal health, um, foot drop uh, related to nerve damage, um, muscle weakness, and things like that. Next slide, please. So we've established that there are not enough physiotherapists broadly, and that is in, uh, including at uh, Pansy Hospital. When we first uh, were, were starting our work there, there was a single uh, physiotherapist who was responsible for um, all physiotherapy services at the hospital. Um, and this is a large scale tertiary care uh, facility. So pediatrics and adult care, um, neurologic conditions, uh, orthopedic conditions, um, even chest physiotherapy and things like that. Uh, so while she was very interested to learn women's health, um, uh, we'll learn more about women's health, um, her capacity to both engage in learning and care provision was a little bit limited. Um, so uh, we, we really worked with the gynecologists and the fistula surgeons to, um, to build up their understanding of both the role of physiotherapy and then uh, because they're already doing, uh, for example, pelvic examinations when women come in the door, um, we, we worked with them to, to instruct in pelvic floor muscle examinations and to be able to start to um, identify um, 
some of the, the, the problems that may be amenable to physiotherapy so that then they could guide treatment from there. So they are a little bit of the gatekeeper to the rehabilitation services that a woman may uh, receive. And she may be sent directly for one-on-one -on -one physio or perhaps engage in um, a, like a, group, a group model. Next slide, please. Um, we did certainly work with the physiotherapist. Um, I don't want to minimize her role at all. We, we worked um, quite a bit to provide one-on-one -on -one clinical training to her. We also were able to open up some of that training to other physiotherapists in the area um, so that she was, um, uh, some of her treatment techniques and her, her, her skills in terms of treatment uh, were really enhanced in terms of manual therapy, exercise treatment and progression and things like that. Um, next slide, please. And then um, we also worked with the, um, the team of social workers and nurses. Um, we had a large group of midwives that was very interested to learn um, just some of the basics. Um, so we were able to provide a series of lectures and hands-on training um, so that really anyone uh, could be uh, responsible for providing some patient education as it relates to physical therapy care um, or uh, in leading a group exercise program. Next slide, please. Um, I'll allow Dr. Raha and Dr. Kinja's words to speak um, really for the, the program benefits, but, um, but as we've mentioned before, we really took this um, approach of task sharing and task shifting um, in order to really make the program what it is today. Um, we have had some successes. Women are consistently going to physiotherapy. Um, uh, most women are going in a group setting, but some women are also receiving one-on-one -on -one care, to, um, particularly if they need sort of a hands-on um, intervention. Um, there, it has taken some time, but um, but we we have a couple of local champions that we call them. So Dr. Kinja certainly um, came on board a couple of years ago, and really, um, her you know part of her role was to to kind of own this program in a sense, um, and to really ensure that all women were being cycled through physiotherapy or the various different. Um, uh, treatment and interventions. Um, and we've had some uh, reported successes, um, which you'll hear in just a moment. Um, I think we'll go ahead and play the video followed by the audio uh, recording of Dr. Raha. My name is Kenny Ra Maroi. I am an OBGYN and traumatic fistula surgeon. I've been working at Panzi Hospital with Professor Dennis Mukwege for 14 years. In addition, I am a teacher at Université Evangelique en Afrique, where we train doctors in good obstetrical practice. Some of them come from different provinces of my country, the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's well known that fistula surgery is spectacularly life-changing for women. Multidisciplinary, including other services such physiotherapy, psychologists, and so on, synergistically give better results. I have traveled in several provinces of the Congo for, for, for outreach to treat women suffering from fistula and pelvic organ prolapse. Our patients always require physiotherapy and for good healing after fistula surgery and even after prolapse management. I believe that physiotherapy is necessary for bladder rehabilitation, decreasing chronic pelvic pain for a fibrotic pelvic and for some kind of urinary incontinence after fistula surgery. We are very grateful to our colleagues, Laura and Jessica, and all the partners for the effort to, in supporting the Pansy Hospital team. We are currently involved in research on childbirth trauma to improve the poor maternal and child health conditions in our region and in the DRC. I have uh, two stories, many stories, but uh, uh, it's um, from one patient eight years ago, 18 years ago. She's, she's part of one and uh, she had um, a fistula after a prolonged labor. Mm. And uh, 
at that level, the double bilateral episiotomy was, was, was done. Mm. And she unfortunately had a childbirth mm. uh, on the same pregnancy. And she came with um, a severe fibrosis in the hospital mm. and we tried to fix this, the fistula. Uh, but um, in post op- operation, operative um, time, she developed pain, uh, pelvic pain, um, due to this uh, condition of fibrosis. And we, we more than the, the surgery, we tried to orient the hair to physio for exercise, pelvic exercise. And uh, what we, we saw it was that uh, this pain uh, decreased. Mm-hmm. And uh, her quality of life uh, seemed to be better than uh, before. The second is um, a, a patient with uh, uh, fistula, fistula, and uh, it was a non-common etiology of fistula because it was not a, an obstetric fistula. It was like uh, an infection. Okay. Uh, after infection, she developed mm-hmm. a fistula, and we tried to. We, we made surgery and to treat her, but unfortunately, um, after um, the surgery and when we, we have removed the, the foley catheter, she had a problem of voiding. And uh, when we tried to make a urodynamic and all the examination, we found that it was in a, in a continence, urinary incontinence, which was mixed. Uh, we tried to give her drugs and uh, we had physiotherapy. And uh, the patient had a good evolution, and uh, now she she can just avoid avoid uh, by herself, and uh, her condition was improved by this combination of drugs and uh, physio in this mixed urinary incontinence. So, Kenny, what um, what are some of the challenges that you have faced um, as we've tried to build this physio program? It's been um, a number of years now. Um, what do you see as some of the, um, the obstacles that you faced along the way? Yeah, thank you. To adapt the physio in both fistula and uh, pop patients. And the team was not keen on, on specific um, fistula or pop rehabilitation. And this was um, a deep challenge in uh, our daily practice. And because I can sum- summarize that, we, we didn't have a skillful uh, physiotherapy based in this um, kind of uh, disease. Mm-hmm. And uh, sadly, uh, this was uh, the, the Elana challenge was to understand uh, the understanding of patients. Uh, some of them uh, in this uh, low income countries, they know that uh, to be cured is to have surgery. And mm-hmm. uh, when we could tell them just to, just to be killed, uh, cured by uh, physio, it was uh, difficult to them to understand. It was a challenge. And uh, another challenge here is a limited team for outreach uh, campaign. What do you see, um, or, or how, what are ways that you would like to see um, physiotherapy grow, at, either at Pansy or at some of the outreach sites? Here we would like to, to improve, you know, services to have more physio um, here, skillful uh, physio, and uh, to, to expand this uh, when we go for outreach for, uh, so that pe- pe- people, patients there can benefit from this service. Pansy embraces a multidisciplinary approach um, to providing care, um, but I wondered if you could just summarize um, how that teaching um, and the relationship has maybe helped shift the thinking about physio, not just for yourself, but more broadly for the team. Yeah, thank you for the question. From this uh, training, uh, I can say that we have learned many things, uh, like many roles of the physiotherapy and uh, physiotherapists. Understand that it's, well, it's very important to decrease length of uh, the stay in the hospital. Uh, mm-hmm. And we can uh, see that it's very important because when we, we go, uh, we, we see uh, how it had to improve the sh- um, short or uh, long-term health outcome. And sometimes uh, we can see the benefits in reducing the need of expensive medical procedure or repeated surgeries. We understand that uh, appropriated 
physiotherapeutical uh, treatment technique uh, restore function uh, and improve quality of life. And this we, we can testify because we have seen it. And uh, more of this, uh, uh, we can see that the, to treat acute or co- chronic injury by physio, it uh, gives a good result. We just um, wish you all the best because we know um, the work you have done here is a, a great uh, job and we would like to, to improve, to stay in connection to see how we can improve this. So um, we have been unable to get uh, Dr. Kinja to join us on the line, as Laura mentioned earlier. So we have a few of her quotes that were prepared in case she was unable to join live. Um, And um, you see her there in the center of the photo. Um, She's been a tremendous and enthusiastic support for us. And I'm just going to read her words um, aloud. Since 2018, I have been leading the physiotherapy department in the Pansy Hospital. In our practice, we guide the physiotherapy sessions to all patients admitted to Pansy Hospital for urinary fistula for first degree prolapse. We work in collaboration with the physiotherapist of the hospital's kine department. Next slide, please. Physiotherapy activities have been implemented among all female staff engaged in the hospital. Women engaged in the Pansy Foundation, as well as at V-Day. Women are involved and love to participate in the sessions. Among them, we think of choosing those which can serve as focal points or constitute a small subcommittee, which ensures leading the subgroups. Physiotherapy sessions are systematic in women presenting to the antenatal care department from the 36th week with the aim of preparation for childbirth. It is still difficult for us to follow up in postpartum. Next slide, please. The bulk of the material we use in our services is a donation sent by our collaborators, Laura and Jessica. The hospital, the Pansy Foundation, and the V-Day House provide us with others. We carry out the sessions three times a week according to a fixed schedule. The morning sessions, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., are intended for patients with fistulas and prolapse. From 12 p.m. to 1 p.m., we perform sessions for hospital staff on Tuesday and Friday. From 3 p.m. to 4.15 p.m., sessions are held at the Foundation Pansy every Monday and Thursday. Next slide, please. At the hospital, we have a room problem. We are obliged to do sessions in multiple groups, which is tiring and takes longer. Concerning the current context of COVID-19, we have stopped the physiotherapy sessions for the staff and have maintained the sessions for the patients. We will resume at the beginning of this month of September and are planning to organize a major activity to promote our activities at the provincial level to train and inform our community. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura and Jessica and Dr. Raha and Kinja, who were unable to physically be with us today. This has been really um, informative to understand uh, the implementation of the, of the program at Pansy Hospital and the achievements and acceptability, as well as some of the challenges that have been faced. I'd like to transition over to some questions from the audience now, and I would like to again remind the audience to enter their questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So one, so the first question will be for, <clears throat> for Laura. I'd like to ask, um, you've talked about working with a variety of providers across Pansy and across other healthcare settings as well as working intensively with a physiotherapist at Pansy, it would be really interesting to understand what your perspective is on the extent of education that um, trained physiotherapists are getting in this topical area within a typical training program. Can you talk a little more about that? Sure, excuse me. Um, 
Well, there is quite a lot of variation um, across um, countries and, and, and even within countries. Um, I, we, we've seen this even in the United States as our, as our profession has progressed towards doctoral level degree. Um, uh, so for example, in Congo, um, there are a number of sort of tech, uh, technician level trained uh, physiotherapists. So maybe it wasn't a university program, but, um, but a two year um, kind of post um, graduate program. And that is where, um, when I first started working in the Congo uh, in 2009, where most people were, and they had just gotten um, a university program going within the recent years, again, about 10 years ago. So now we have a kind of a growth of um, university trained um, physios there. Um, I would say, it, again, it, it, it's quite variable. I think that they are learning um, some about this, but, but for the most part, it's pretty, um, pretty new information. Um, I don't know if Jessica has anything to add, add to that. No, I think that, that summarizes it. Yeah. yeah. Great, thank you so much. So the second question coming from our attendees was somewhat brought up um, during Dr. Kinja's comments, and that's about follow-up for physical exercises at home. Mm -hmm. um, in the comment, Dr. Kinja mentioned that it is a challenge to follow up in the postpartum period, mm -hmm. and um, it appears that much of the work or much of the um, classes that are being held are at the facility. What guidance do you have for home care, both for continuation of exercises and strength building, as well as um, for women who are unable to access to, to attend care regularly due to access or transport issues? Great, that's a great point. Um, certainly the, the reproduction of any materials that women could take with them when they leave a facility um, is out of our ability to, to provide. But for, um, for anyone who has downloaded the manual, the section that talks about treatment um, has you know, pictures of exercises and depictions. So that is something that can be printed or reproduced, um, whether that is through laminated cards that go home with a woman. Um, I would leave that probably to the facility to figure out. But um, you know, our we have we've endeavored to try to provide some um, solve for that problem by having materials that that can be reproduced that are instructional by imagery only. So it doesn't require um, literacy to be able to follow along that someone could be instructed um, by someone at the, the hospital or facility and then have images to take home um, as some some instructions. Thank you. <laughs> so I'd like to have us transition over to Vandana. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thanks so much. Um, and thank you, Laura, Jessica, Kenny, and Rachel for sharing this great work um, and it really reminds us how crucial holistic care is in maternal health um, and in programs addressing fistula we know women have so many needs besides just closing the hole and we also know how powerful interventions beyond surgery can be and you've reminded us of that power today in fistula care plus in uganda we worked with a partner terawode um, and what we found there was that even for women whose fistula could not be treated, individualized interventions that included psychosocial support, um, economic development interventions, life skills education, these things resulted in profound improvements in mental health and quality of life. So if holistic interventions can be so effective for women who continue to live with fistula and cannot be treated, just imagine how powerful they can be for women in conjunction with effective clinical care. Within holistic um, care, when we come specifically to physiotherapy or PT, uh, the evidence is really mounting. Numerous studies are showing us that women with mild pelvic organ prolapse or urinary incontinence benefit from pelvic floor muscle therapy. 
including a 2015 review that found subjective improvements, so women reporting improvements in their experience symptoms, but also objective improvements in the severity of prolapse using um, the POPQ system for women who got PT. Um, similarly, a Cochrane review in 2014 recommended PT as the first line conservative management for stress urinary incontinence. Um, unfortunately, the evidence is more limited when it comes to fistula, as Laura showed us. Um, but in 2018, the International Continent Society's Physiotherapy Committee issued what I think is the first consensus document, noting that all women affected by fistula may benefit from pelvic floor muscle assessment, um, from education and exercises, coming back to this idea of home care um, to optimize the outcome of their surgery. And the committee expressed consensus that if physiotherapy is part of that multidisciplinary team, patients' outcomes will be better. And I want to quote their conclusions that physiotherapy should not be overlooked when we plan fistula services. Um, but the ICS statement also noted the, that there are gaps in research and in evidence um, about PT and fistula care. Our moderator, Allison, and her colleagues actually this year published, I think, the first um, systematic scoping review looking at reintegration and rehabilitation after fistula surgery, after that repair. And they found promising outcomes, including the study in Benin that Laura referred to, where there was more repair success, less persistent incontinence, and improved quality of life for women who got PT. But um, as Laura mentioned, there, there, and in this review, in Allison's review, there are only two articles on PT after fistula care, and one of them was Laura's work in Kenya. So we have such a clear need for more evidence, but we also need greater comparability between programs so we can actually talk about what works. And in that context, um, I think the tools, this training manual that you've heard about today is um, a way to formalize and standardize the integration of PT into fistula care. Um, and that way future research can build on these frameworks established by Laura, by Jessica and others so that we can have more robust evidence for the power of holistic care within the treatment of fistula specifically, but maternal morbidity more generally. So I wanna close um, by reflecting on a report that was actually here in the US. It was in ACNM's journal, the Journal of Midwifery and Women's Health. And um, Lawson and Sachs, they described the barriers to using pelvic floor PT, even in high resource settings like the US. They talked about um, the fact that routine training on these interventions is just not part of pre-service curricula for most of the relevant clinical professions. And I just wanna quote from their conclusion. There's a lack of resources to appropriately treat patients, uh, to no standardize, teach patients, no standardized treatment protocol to guide clinical practice, and no standard for long-term follow-up care. The first step in addressing these barriers must include addressing healthcare provider knowledge deficits about the benefits of pelvic floor PT. Now the landscape is really different where these writers work, but this rings so true to me um, in terms of what is needed in the countries where fistula is a burden and where FC plus works. So when we think about you know, that knowledge deficit for providers, let alone for patients, I hope that this manual that we've been able to support Laura and Jessica to develop the work that Kenny and Rachel have done at Pansy, I hope these are crucial first steps in overcoming these barriers. It's really frustrating that PT remains out of reach for so many women suffering from incontinence, from fistula, from prolapse, and from other morbidities in low resource settings. And it's particularly in these low resource settings that we always need to be looking for alternatives to surgery when appropriate the capacity to perform safe surgery remains limited. When we can do other things or um, combine interventions, we really can improve the quality of care and safety for women. And that might be using catheters to treat fresh fistulas instead of doing a surgery. It might be giving women a pessary to help them live with and manage their prolapse symptoms. Um, and it can be PT as part of conservative management or as an adjunct to surgical care. So I hope this discussion encourages program folks and clinicians to think more about how they can integrate PT and holistic care overall into their services. 
we look forward to your more of your questions, which have already been fantastic, and, and hopefully hearing about some experiences of others who have tackled this. So thank you um, to our speakers and um, thank you to all of the participants. And I'll hand it back to Allison. Thank you so much, Vandanam. So we have about uh, 10 minutes for questions and wrap up. So I would, would love to invite attendees to, to share any additional questions that they have. I'd like to start with a question for Laura or Jessica. Um, and this is building off of what Vandana has discussed around some of the um, some of the challenges with the, the current evidence base around both um, the impact of physiotherapy on morbidities and, and um, functional challenges associated with maternal morbidities, as well as um, questions that we have around best practices for implementing um, these types of interventions. What do you think we can, we can do to increase the level of evidence? What might be um, best practices for increasing this evidence base? Um, I could talk as could Laura for far more than 10 minutes on this subject. Um, but I, there are two uh, thoughts I'd like to start with uh, and then invite Laura to add. Um, the first is that there, um, there is still work to be done to advance the role of rehabilitation professionals as a part of the healthcare team that is involved in women's healthcare. Um, multiple examinations of the burden of disability has not, um, you know, incorporated women's health and then kind of vice versa. There was a, um, a World Health Organization maternal morbidity working group that embarked on a number of really wonderful papers and great work um, talking about defining maternal morbidity, um, creating a construct to think about um, how that carries on throughout a woman's life and, you know, kind of the life course and life cycle ways that that um, affects her and putting out a call to have um, a greater um, both research emphasis and clinical um, programming to support care for maternal morbidities. And I bring this up because um, number one, they, they recommended as a part of um, supporting the research um, and clinical tracking to use a um, disability assessment scale created by the World Health Organization. So it's the WHODAS. Um, and we are familiar with that. That is included in the manual. Um, but despite that look at, um, at function and disability and the use of language quite um, kind of coming from the heart of the rehabilitation community, um, the recommendations for any of the, I think it was 122 maternal morbidities were named. It included low back pain. It included urinary incontinence. Um, it included fistula and no rehabilitation intervention was mentioned as a possible treatment intervention. Um, so there's work to be done kind of from a, a policy perspective um, and from the, the broader maternal healthcare community to look at that, which influences research, right? If the people who are conducting research are not talking with the rehabilitation professionals um, and incorporating them, it's really hard for us to be able to make progress in that space. Um, so setting that aside, um, we have included in this manual um, examples that are you know, available for use of several validated um, patient reported outcome measures. So that includes inventories on sexual function, on urinary incontinence, um, and the HUDAS, so on um, global disability. Um, and we encourage that to be a part of the regular charting um, so that those can be used um, even in a retrospective review um, to be able to look at change in response to a treatment if that is already embedded as a part of the chart, because one of the, the problems that shows up um, in some of the very limited data that we have is that a retrospective review um, leaves a lot of holes because the documentation is not following a, a formalized charting process. So those are, um, like I said, the, probably the shortest that I can try to button up those few comments, but um, please, Laura, um, add, add your thoughts. Um. I think I feel like you covered <laughs> quite a bit of it. I, I did want to mention um, the outcome measures because I think um, it's a very um, 
kind of simple and easy way to to meaningfully meaningfully track outcomes over time. Um, you know, in, in Rachel's quote, she she brings up the problem of you know even follow up postpartum, and of course this is also true postoperatively, and um, and that's the tricky thing with rehabilitation. You know, we, rehab takes time. You know, a surgery is a single time point, hopefully just a single time point, um, and often outcomes are good. Um, out, you know, soon after that, um, so so it's hard to to attribute success to to any one particular thing aside from the surgery, at least in that time point, you know, Im immediately following that surgery. But what we, what we often see is over time and what, you know, some of Allison's work has, has um, shed light on is that, you know, a year later is when, when, you know, we can kind of tease out some differences between um, some, some women versus other women and, and their experience postoperatively. And I think that is where we may, may begin to see um, the true effects of rehab, you know, if, it, if it's been mm -hmm. implemented well. Um, so, and that's a challenge and one um, I think we can continue talking about, I know Pansy does a great job at trying to do outreach. Um, I know anyone, anyone doing fistula work uh, does mm -hmm. the best they can to, to, to do some long-term um, follow-up. So I think continuing um, uh, on those efforts as well. Yeah, and I um, think that it's really important for both of us to acknowledge that on this front, um, Dr. Kenny has been uh, an incredible partner, is passionate about research in many capacities, but is supporting um, supporting us working with him to be able to start uh, examining disability, um, for example, in a population of women with fistula, um, for us to be able to implement some various ways to start studying this work at Pansy. So um, I know that he, you know, is on the line, but had some um, audio issues preventing him from being able to join in and comment. But I really think it's important for us to acknowledge that as challenging as this is, um, he is someone who is is really a champion of of research um, in this space and um, a great partner for for us in that regard. Thank you both. That was um, for for touching on both the research as well as the kind of policy focal needs and um, and the role of critical individuals at, at different facilities in, in prioritizing uh, assessment of, um, of the different pieces that will help us move forward in this, in this field, as well as acknowledging the, the challenges uh, inherent to both research and clinical follow-up, which, which are important for, for this question, as well as for a number of other questions that we're, we're looking to understand for women with um, fistula. I am going to um, ask a question of Vandana. The question from the attendee is given or in light of the anniversary, the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration tomorrow, how do you think physiotherapy as a treatment route or supportive adjunct treatment can help to advance the empowerment of women living with fistula? I can certainly begin, and then I think Laura and Jessica have probably a more profound <laughs> way to think about this. Um, but I wanna actually answer partly by re uh, reading someone else's comment that came in during this. One of our attendees said, I feel strongly, well, first of all, that this is overdue. I feel strongly that all women could and should benefit from the knowledge and strategies outlined in the presentation and training manual to adapt and self-manage their health. It's such a big gap worldwide, not only in LMICs. And I don't know who said that, but I think you get right at what our other um, question comes to, which is empowerment. And I think there's been a lot of um, thinking and building of frameworks around self-care lately in women's health. And I think that the PT really bridges, right? Um, the continuum from services that are received that are provided in the clinical context, and then services that can really be taken on and owned by the woman herself. And so I think not just for fistula, but for prolapse, for incontinence, for morbidities that we know a plurality of women suffer from by the end of their reproductive um, age, that it can be incredibly empowering to know about these things um, in any setting. So that's my instinct. And I love that, that someone linked it to Beijing plus 25, that um, <laughs> empowerment comes in many forms. And some of them are are in physical forms. Um, I don't know, Laura and Jessica, if you'd like to add anything to that. Go ahead, Laura. Um, 
Um, so many thoughts are coming to mind. Uh, thank you. And I'm like, where do I begin with this one? Um, well, certainly, um, well, we, well, uh, we know that physical well-being is very much tied to our mental well-being, and um, and Allison has reported on that in her work, and um, and as well as in other areas. Um, so I think, you know, fortifying the body is, you know, itself, uh, you know, um, at a very granular level, empowering, um, but certainly has has rippling effects in terms of of kind of agency and 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 self empowerment. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I think that also tied with with the education piece. So sort of the you know thinking of physio as this strengthening you know exercise and things like that, um, get, uh, preparing the body to to reengage with the world. Um, uh, yeah. So um, so yeah, I think I'll I'll leave it there and, and hand it over to you, Jess. <laughs> yeah, I think the added part, um, certainly beyond um, this is a very big picture comment, but I think that um, to neglect. Uh, the burden of disability among women is to limit their ability to participate economically in society, right? So that is not necessarily the space that we are living in right now when we think purely of healthcare, but when we're, when we're talking about women's health, women's empowerment, agency for women and their rights, broadly speaking, um, it's really clearly recognized that um, women's financial empowerment and agency is part of lifting up her family, her community, and entire countries. Um, so I think if we, if we accept that um, kind of as a, as a guiding point or as, as truth in this space about women, that when we consider maternal health, and if we consider that mortality rates are declining and that that by definition means morbidity rates are increasing. So we have more people living, more people who have survived childbirth, um, that conveys health conditions that may be linked to, to disability. Um, I think, you know, in light of this big picture, you know, anniversary of, of um, you know, of Beijing, just thinking about how there becomes um, even an economic imperative to be addressing uh, physical rehabilitation um, and other aspects of of health um, in in helping you know women truly to be um, you know at their best. Thank you so much. I, uh, I really love that last question and love the, the variety of responses that it solicited from um, three of our presenters. And I agree that, that it is a topic that we could be talking about for um, much longer than the few minutes that we have allocated to it. So I would just like to, again, thank all of our presenters Jessica, Laura, Rachel, Kenny, and Vandana for this incredibly important and inspiring presentation and, <clears throat> and discussion that's come out of it. I'd also like to thank USAID for making the work that we've shared today possible and everyone who's joined us online today. For those individuals who have asked questions that were not able to be addressed during our um, presentation, we will be providing answers in a blog post, which will be coming out probably within the next week. And if you'd like to share this presentation with other individuals who are unable to attend We'll be sending out the direct link to the recording to individuals who were registered for the session, and it will also be available on the Fistula Care website. So please follow up at um, the FC Plus website, www.fistulacare.org, as well as www.themamas.world. And that's also the link for um, accessing the training guide. So there were a few questions that were, were specifically focused on the training guide. And I think um, going in and, and downloading that guide will provide you with a lot of, um, a lot more detail on, on what is there. And certainly um, you can follow up with Laura and Jessica via their website. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.
Thanks Thank all. Thank you. Bye-bye.